Um, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the latest in our In Conversation series uh, tonight with Joe Swinson, uh, who, uh, apart from a brief interregnum between 2015 and 2017, uh, has been the MP for East Dunbartonshire since 2005. Um, she was a minister in the coalition, uh, and she's now deputy leader of the Lib Dems and foreign affairs spokesperson. Um, last time at these events, we had uh, Jacob Rees Mogg, uh, who is the bookie's favorite to be conservative leader. Um, you're currently the bookie's favorite to be the next Lib Dem leader. Um, I'm trying Emily Thornbury, but I'm getting nowhere. Uh, um, the format tonight will be the same as usual. We will chat for a little bit. Uh, you will get frustrated with my inability to ask a, a decent, uh, sharp question. Uh, and then we'll throw it open to, to you, and you can ask whatever you want of Joe. Um, let's start with some questions about the Lib Dems as a party and where they are at the moment. Um, it, it, almost impossible to go a day at the moment without some rumor or whisper of a new center party being formed, a, uh, a sensible, centrist, pro-European party. Um, what does it say about the existing sensible, centrist, pro-European party that everyone seems to think we need a new one? Um, well, I think one of the things is that it tells you a bit about tribalism in politics, because quite a few of the people that will talk about needing one um, have previously or currently are in another party, often the Labour Party, and uh, and I think you know the 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 um, ability to decide that another party exists that actually is that answer is is a bit more difficult if you're sort of died in the wheel Labour. Um, I mean, I think the other thing is the other group of people who posit the idea of a new centrist party, I think often come with, uh, let's just say, much less political experience and perhaps a naive view of how straightforward it is to, you know, get stuck in, win elections, you know, that democratic process and particularly how easy or otherwise it is for a new political force to do that. And... I mean, it, it's perhaps a bit of a cop-out as a Liberal Democrat, you know, constantly blaming the voting system. But I do think the voting system that we have is um, actually underpins a lot of the dysfunctional nature of our current politics. So you've got a Labour Party, which in most European countries would not be one party. You've got a Conservative Party, ditto. You know, you would not typically find Jacob Rees-Mogg and Anna Subri in the same party, or John McDonnell and Liz Kendall in the same party. But yet... Those are the two sort of massive behemoth parties that we have, um, partly because our voting system is stacked against um, new parties coming in, or even in the case of the Liberal Democrats, you know, a third party, you know, flourishing um, consistently, you know, year after year, election after election. So, um, so I think that's actually part of the answer about you know why a new centrist party isn't actually going to fly, and the Lib Dems are the best bet. Um, but, I mean, you're right, there's a question there about, you know, how successfully we get that message out there. And, you know, I think that will, you know, constantly be tested electorally. We are, if you look at the existing electoral tests in council by-elections, doing incredibly well. Um, so I think there is some cause for cheer, but I equally think, you know, I think we'd be kidding if we said we had it all licked. But, but is it also a problem, bluntly, with the brand? that for whatever reason, and however unfair you may think it is, and presumably do think it is, that part of the problem is that those five years in coalition uh, mean that at the last election, the, the big electoral test, you weren't able to make the breakthrough that many of you maybe felt you would have done. Um, I mean, I, I'm a marketer previously before I went into politics. Uh, so, you know, I do love branding. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think, you know, in the commercial world, you know, you make slightly different decisions um, about branding. Um, but, you know, we've, you know, Liberal Democrats, the clue is in the name. You know, it's about you know, our democratic system. It's, it's about liberalism. Um, so I think, you know, we've got the essentials there. Um, and, and actually, if you, I mean, if you, certainly in the 2015 election, if you look at what led to us losing lots of seats, you know, it, it wasn't actually people that were disgusted with the Liberal Democrats having gone into coalition. You know, we lost most of the seats that we lost to the Conservatives because people who had voted Lib Dem then chose to vote Conservatives. So these people weren't, you know, appalled at us going into coalition. So I think it's a lot more complex than, uh, than just sort of assuming that somehow we're tarnished because we went into government. There definitely is an element where 
having for many years um, picked up some of the protest vote and the sort of anti-establishment, that was harder to do as a governing party and as a party that's recently been in government. But I still think that, you know, you're in politics to change things. And I still think that, you know, the decision we made to go into government was the right decision. I'm not going to say every single individual decision we got right while we were there. Of course, we made mistakes, but um, but we got that big decision right because, you know, you need to you need to change the world if you're in politics. That's what it's about. To, the, to those disaffected people in the Conservative Party or the Labour Party, of which there are many on both sides at the moment, um, what's your message? I mean, would your message be come and join us or would your message be stay where you are and fight? I think it depends on what the individual wants to do. You know, I, I recognise that there are small L liberal people in other parties. And indeed, on Brexit issues, I am working very closely with those individuals, um, people like Chuka Amuna and Anna Subri and Caroline Lucas. And while we might have disagreements on th some things, actually, there's a huge amount that we agree on. And clearly, if people you know, who, who have liberal values want to join the Lib Dems, they will be very welcome. Uh, but I do also recognise the, the value that individuals bring you know, by ploughing those furrows within their own parties. And, so, and, and I also understand that for people to switch party, you know, it's, it's, it's not a straightforward thing for them to do. So, um, so I'm not going to sort of judge people for not doing that. If people want to work with us and, uh, and campaign jointly on issues where we agree and where we can, particularly in the... Uh, the, the arithmetic of the parliament that we're in right now, where we can get real change, uh, then, then I'm very open to, to finding ways to, to work with people in different parties. I think that's important. And as a liberal, as someone who supports proportional representation, I am also a pluralist. So that's part of how I think politics should be done. There's a, a really interesting paradox at the moment, it seems to me, which is that 20 years ago, we'd have taught politics and political parties in, in terms of sort of spatial dimension. And we'd have said that the Liberal Democrats would do really well when the other parties were far apart, because they, mm. the other parties would move to the extremes and they would free up this space in the centre ground. And at the moment, the other parties are about as far apart as they've been since the 70s, and yet you're, in opinion polls, stuck on sort of seven, eight percentage points, even if doing a little bit better yeah. in some local by-elections. You did best when they were really close together. Um, and I don't, I don't know what that tells us about contemporary politics, um, except perhaps that at the moment, politics is being painted in very primary yeah. colours, yeah. and people with so so the, the appeal of Corbyn is clear. Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we had Jacob Rees-Mogg here last time, and his appeal is clear, uh, even if not always to maybe you. Um, what's the Liberal Democrat equivalent? of the Corbyn phenomenon or the or momentum? Um, uh, well, I, I'm not sure. Is it just being sensible? Well, you know, this is it. I mean, you know, being fairly reasonable and pragmatic isn't really in vogue at the moment. Um, but, you know, call me old fashioned. I, I think that it, it may come back in. I think it may come back into fashion. Um, but I, I mean, partly because, first of all, I think the current situation feels quite unsustainable. So there's a big chunk of people who look with dismay at politics at the moment. Now, you know, are they in opinion polls saying, actually, I've decided that it's the Lib Dems that I'm going to vote for? Well, they're not necessarily there yet. But I think they are far more in play in an electoral sense than, um, than, than even several months ago. So it may well be that, that we're able to, to um, capitalise on that. But I do... I do really think this division, not just in politics, but in society, is a problem. Um, and it's not just a sort of problem politically for the Lib Dems. I, I actually think it's a problem that more widely needs solving. The disregard for the facts, the we've had enough of experts. And you get that on both sides of the, the sort of more extreme parts of the left and right of the political spectrum. I mean, Corbyn is, is great on kind of rhetoric and oratory and passion. But when you actually look at, you know, do his plans add up, then it starts to fall apart. And, you know, you'll find on the, the right, then, you know, we just get 
this sort of fantasy world peddled by some of the arch Brexiteers about this land of milk and honey that's going to apparently appear. And I, I mean, I don't know if they realise that it's not going to appear or if they just think if we get to after March 2019, it doesn't matter because we'll be out of the EU and then everyone will realise it and it'll be too late. Um, but So it, it's sort of a suspended sort of reality that, that they're operating in. Um, and, and, you know, you could argue that one thing to do would be, well, you just have to get more extreme in the way you're talking about things. But that's also not how I want to do politics. So I want to find a way to connect and to, yes, be radical and bold on policy options, you know, where where it's warranted, because I do think that lots of things about society aren't working, and that is what's called for, and I think there's appetite for that rightly. But I also want those things to be thought through, um, grounded in some kind of understanding, although some elements might be a risk, so that you can say, well, actually, yes, this is bold step, but we we recognise that we think this will succeed for these reasons, and it is it's something which we're going to try to do. So uh, that's where I think the future of sort of radical liberalism is. It, yeah, it's it's radical, but also reasonable and, and just rooted into real re in reality as well. So if I was to say, well, what's the route back to fifteen percent, let alone twenty percent? It's kind of sort of to wait until it all goes wrong, and then people will realise how sensible you are. No, no, I, I, no. I, so I'm not absolving us of the need to do any work here. Um, I think we do. I mean, if I mean, you talked earlier about how we're now in a situation where there's a sort of politics on the extremes, which we perhaps had in the early 1980s. Um, and in the 1990s and the, the early 2000s, you had this sort of consensus where all of the parties were sort of in the centre ground and people were saying things like, why do you need the Liberal Democrats? And, you know, they're, they're not saying that now in the same way because, you know, you've got two parties that, in terms of leadership, are pretty pro-Brexit. So, you you know, you, you've got this, this space, as you say. Um, but... Uh, but therefore, what we need, we do need some different policy answers. Um, we had the financial crash in 2008. Um, that has had a massive impact on living standards. And yet, we haven't radically changed the way the system works in terms of business, in terms of executive pay and so on. Um, we've got this division in society as a result of the referendum and, you know, Sad news, I don't think it'll be any better three years on because, you know, we're four years on from the Scottish independence referendum and, and it's a pretty divided country still. Um, and, I, and I think we need to find ways to heal that division. And I think politicians have got a responsibility, but I think there's probably wider efforts needed within communities on that to have some more cohesion of society. And it's not just referendum um, campaigns that do that. It's also the wider kind of uh, trends in social media, echo chambers, and, and so on, which mean that there's uh, much more fragmentation of where people are getting their their, their news, their sources, and uh, and can end up in sort of belief circles where something fe feels like it's reality and, and perhaps is not. Um, and and I think we need to, as as you know, liberals, as people of this sort of centre, you know, progressive politics, need to find better solutions to that. And I, you know, I'm I'm going to say I think we've got some of the building blocks already, but that's what I'm spending my time on. And I don't think they've got it sussed in any country really. I think if you look at America, you look at the Democrats, they've been um, grappling with this issue, and look at plenty of the European parties. You know, this is this is a wider trend. But my goodness, I think it's one that we need to we need to solve. We need to find those answers. So, so last year there was the chance, obviously, to have a go at getting yourself back electorally, and you, you did okay in Scotland. And um, number of seats quadrupled went up. our seats in Scotland. I mean, I think by any measure that's pretty good from a very low base. <laughs> from uh, one to four, from one to four, uh, it's still quadrupling. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> if, if that's the measure of success. Mm. Um, <laughs> So what, 48 next time yeah, round, that'd yeah. be, yeah. Uh, but actually the vote share went down, number of lost deposits went yeah. up. Um, why, why do you think the last election wasn't really a success? I mean, what went wrong? Well, I, th I think there's, first of all, I think there's different ways of uh, judging the success. If okay, you, well, if do, you, do you think it was so, a success? So uh, in some ways it was. So in, t in the aftermath of 2015, you've got to remember, you know, we'd gone from 57 MPs to eight. 
people were writing us off, you know, can the Liberal Democrats survive? You know, there was, there was basically an existential fight for survival. And you know what? When you've gone down to eight seats, the ability of the other parties to pick you off as well, you know, it's not just a, well, then we've gone down to our lowest possible. I mean, actually, you've got much less uh, of a, a solid base in order to, to push outwards from. So, so I think, you know, we did one of the basic things that we needed to do out of that election, which was to hold our ground and ideally to expand. And we did that. You know, we went from eight MPs from the previous election to 12 MPs. I think also important, we improved our diversity significantly and we've got a good mix with new blood. Four of those MPs had never been MPs before. So we've got the sort of new talent coming uh, coming through and, and that is also important. But would I have liked us to have many more? Clearly. Now, it was a, you know, it was a short notice election. I I tell you what, I, the number of people I told very confidently Theresa May wasn't going to call an election. You can tell she doesn't want to do it. I mean, I think she didn't want to do it. And then, obviously, was talked into it on an on a alpine walk or wherever she was. And... Um, and, and was pretty much regretting it. Um, so I didn't think there was going to be an election, and you know that that presents its own challenges. Yes, you know for all parties, but you know certainly, um, certainly for us, where the on the ground constituency work and the run up to an election is so important. Um, and it was a very polarising election, and, and that is one of the things where, as you say, when all the parties are very close together, we did well. Well, I think one of the things was people weren't so scared of the alternative. You know, conservatives who weren't terrified of you know, Tony Blair being in number 10 could vote Liberal Democrat with a, you know, fairly easy conscience to get a great Liberal Democrat MP in their local area because they weren't, they weren't petrified of, of what a Blair government would do. And, you know, that was not the case even, even with Ed Miliband and certainly in terms of Jeremy Corbyn. And there'd be lots of Conservatives that would say the most important thing to me is to make sure that we don't have um, Jeremy Corbyn in number 10. And ditto, you've now got on a more polarised situation, you know, there was a lot of people, the sort of reluctant Corbyn voters who, you know, with heavy heart voted Labour because they didn't like Labour's position on Brexit, um, but they felt the most important thing was to try to stop a conservative majority. So, so that polarisation you know, doesn't necessarily um, help us as a party. So you know, we had some success, and we need to use that as a springboard to have more. I also think the whole is issue of Brexit, for all that it was an election sort of cold you know, on that issue, uh, a lot of the, the really damaging stuff was not yet in the public domain. You know, the debate, I think, on that, I think public mood on that you know, is not changing swiftly, but there has been some shift. And I think our position was absolutely right to say that the country deserves to have a say on the final deal and to look at the evidence once the negotiation is complete and to make that decision. At the time that we had that policy at the election last June, that was a pretty far out position to take. And now that is the popular position amongst the public. Um, and indeed, many politicians from different parties are supporting that position. Um, do you think that it helped that you spent the first two weeks of the election campaign running a theology seminar? Probably not, if I'm honest, you know. Um, but, uh, but, but, you know, that'll be well poured over in the cephalogical history books, I'm sure. Well, I'm writing it, so it will be. <laughs> um, but, uh, did you have any sympathy for Tim Farron? Um, because because I, I spoke to quite a few Liberal Democrat candidates who say you know they would have their head in their hands during these some of these yeah, interviews, yeah. Um, and in fact several members of his team have said they would have their head in their hand during these interviews. Um, but if I ask you a series of questions about things you believe are or are not sin, presumably you don't Do believe I, in sin, I, well, and I, therefore I, you, I'm a humanist. Get, I don't even yeah, believe in God. So, exactly. I mean, exactly. And therefore therefore you've got to get out of jail free card on this, right? <laughs> But he doesn't. He doesn't. He does believe in God, and therefore he does believe in sin. Um, and did you have any sympathy for him, for the tension between his beliefs uh, and the manifestation of your policy? Well, uh, I mean, my husband's a Christian. I know lots of Christians who have no problem whatsoever with being, you know, full-hearted in support of gay rights, and uh, and not just in support of gay rights, but in not 
perceiving being gay to be a sin. Um, and they don't find that conflicts with their Christianity. And um, clearly Tim has a different view. And so, um, you know, can I feel for somebody who's being asked a question, in essence, to which there is no right answer to? Um, you know, of course, you can you can understand the, the sort of trials. I mean, it probably would have been better to have, you know, uh, gamed that one in terms of, you know, practicing different <laughs> answers in advance to, to, to work it out. But, you know, we are where we are. But, um, I, yeah, it was, it was not helpful for the campaign. Um, and, uh, you know, we're a Liberal Party, and I think it is important that we uh, send a very clear message. I mean, uh, sort of theological discussions, I mean, this is where I have some, that is, you know, that is not necessarily where, what politicians should be held to account on. You know, he was, he was not running for Pope, as he said at one point, which I thought was quite a good way of putting it. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we're still in a world where, um, you know, in parts of the, in countries around the world, people are still executed for being gay. And in this country, there are still, you know, huge amounts of hate crime, discrimination, prejudice, um, you know, everyday bigotry that people come up against. And in those circumstances, I think it is particularly important to, uh, to, to show leadership and to be inclusive, um, and particularly for a liberal leader. And that was basically the problem. You talked earlier about the referendum and your, your policy... I, I always get into trouble with, with, with Liberal Democrats on this because I get the wording wrong. Yeah. Because I stumble and say it's a second referendum, and I get, and they jump on me, they jump yeah, on me and beat me brief. up, and say it's not a second referendum, it's a first referendum on the deal. Yeah, very important distinction. I get, I get that. If we apply that to Scotland, um, you're opposed to another referendum on on Scottish the same question that we had question. last time. Yeah, 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 yeah. But assuming one happens. Assuming one happens, and assuming it, the independence case wins, would you then insist on a referendum on the deal? Well, I think, I think there's a fair case for that. Um, I mean, I think one of the difficulties that people have in an independence referendum or in a referendum on staying in the EU or not is that um, the status quo option <laughs> is fairly well understood. I mean, not perfectly understood, and you know, uh, you could ask lots of people intricate constitutional questions about setups that they would, you know, get wrong. But people have a rough idea of what the status quo looks like. But the people who are arguing for change, uh, you know, they're painting a picture which could just be a pile of nonsense. And actually, they might have a picture of a vision for what they want to achieve that then turns out to be unachievable because it is the result of a negotiation with other parties over whom you don't have control. So I think, given that people will be voting on a, on a premise, um, there, there is a very strong argument, unless you had something where, I mean, in one of the arguments I would say in Scotland, to, to be fair to the SNP, you know, not words you will normally hear me utter, but to be fair to the SNP, they produced a white paper which was a you know, pretty substantial yeah. document about what their vision for an independent Scotland would be. But it was still their vision. It wasn't necessarily what true, would happen. True, true. So in the circumstance where what then was negotiated was very, very similar to their white paper document, then I can see how you might have a, a scenario where you'd say, well, you don't need a referendum because there was the white paper look actually on almost every point, this is what was negotiated and people have voted on that basis. Whereas if you had something that was negotiated that was drastically different to that white paper, you could compare and contrast and say, well, hang on, People voted on the basis of this white paper. That's not what's on offer now, so we should have a, a referendum to check if that's still what people want to do now that they can see that the path is not quite as was outlined, and they might, they might still choose to do that. Um, so I think it's about, you know, when you're making a massive constitutional step, it's about taking people with you and making sure that you're doing that um, and, uh, you know, making sure that people have the right information at, at the right time. And it is very difficult before you've even conducted a negotiation to put all of that detail there. Um, this next bit is going to sound like um, one of those awful talk shows where someone says, I've really enjoyed your book. And, and, and there is a book. Uh, but I did really enjoy the well, I enjoyed the chapter I've read, which is actually the first chapter. Uh, <laughs> but it's the chapter on politics, and yeah. so I thought I kind of should read the chapter on politics. Yeah. Um, and the, it, there's a fascinating story in there about how you became persuaded 
about the merits of all women shortlists. Yeah. Um, and in fact, I'll, I'm talking about this a bit. depressing story. Well, really. I mean, it, it, well t t t t because <laughs> because you were adamantly oh, against I, all women shortlists. I literally had the T-shirt against all women shortlists yeah. when I made my speech against all women shortlists in 2001. I had a pink T-shirt that said, "I am not a token woman." Uh, and I led the fight against that at Lib Dem conference when I was 21. And I said, I didn't say we don't need to do anything, because I realized the massive lack of women in our parliamentary party. At that time, we had, I think, five women out of 43, three women out of 40, no, five women out of 47, something like that. And um, it, it, was, it was pretty dire. Um, but I said, what we need to do is have a massive campaign to go out to talent spot to support, to encourage women to stand for election at all levels of the party, for local council, for devolved assemblies, um, for parliament. And, uh, and then I worked really hard to try to make that happen. I had the fights about getting the budget, you know, the, the endless fights over whether we could get 20 grand out of the party's entire budget to employ somebody um, to, to organize things. And I just wasn't important enough to enough people at the top. And uh, and that's and that sometimes was just a failure of leadership. Some of that I also understood. You know, I get that when you're running a local party and you're a volunteer and you're trying to make sure you print the leaflets and you field a full slate of candidates for the council and you do all of these other things, then you'd like to have more diversity, but have you really got the capacity to go out and ask lots of people? You might think you'd like to do it, but then you don't get around to it. I, I sort of understand that. You know, I, I've, you know, I spent a lot of time as a volunteer in the Lib Dems myself. Um, and that's what I really came to the conclusion, that to make it both urgent and important, you just need to force the issue by saying to people, you have to go and find women candidates, because otherwise you won't have any candidates because these seats are going to be all women shortlists. Um, and I think that we need to apply similar um, measures. There's some legal uh, issues about exactly what you can do, but on other under underrepresented groups as well. Um, you know, we've now got a third of our MPs are women. It's not job done, uh, and that's you know a, a great step forward, um, but we shouldn't be complacent. Um, but we're still a largely white um, uh, party in terms of our electoral representation, uh, and that's problematic too. But yeah, I mean, I, I concluded that that was what it would take. I don't think it is the only way to get change, but I think the level of political leadership you need without it um, is exceptional. Uh, absolutely exceptional and, um, and very difficult to achieve. When you talk about other groups, when you look at the House of Commons, what is the one group that you most think is missing? Oh, I don't. I, you know, I'm going to reject that question. I don't think we should pit different underrepresented groups against. But you have one done. Another. But you have done. You've, you, 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 you start to list some. So I'm asking you, which ones you think are numerically the most underrepresented? Well, we could do the maths on it, and I haven't done the, the full maths. I mean, you know, clearly. Um, BME is very underrepresented. It's always hard to tell exactly how underrepresented LGBT is. Not everybody will obviously be out. Um, and, uh, and of course, disability, you know, some people will be open about disability, but many disabilities are hidden. So um, age is another one where there's, uh, there's, there's underrepresentation. So there's, there is a whole range of groups. And then you've got socioeconomic um, uh, underrepresentation, which is actually getting worse in Parliament. And I, um, along with Hazel Blairs and Eric Lorenshaw, helped co-found the Speaker's Parliamentary Placement Scheme to try to provide different routes into parliamentary work opportunities for people who, you know, are not in that sort of gilded Surrey lifestyle where they get to go and intern for free for years um, while living in central London and get all of that experience and then become a researcher in Parliament and then, you know, become a member of Parliament. You know, we, we need to make sure there's a range of different routes into, um, into doing it. So, uh, I, you know, I think all of those inequalities need to be, need to be addressed. Um, there's a lot in the book, I mean, some of it actually almost um, hand-in-the-mouth, jaw-dropping stuff about changes in attitudes over time as a result of getting more women MPs. There's a very revealing interview with you do with Shirley Williams about her, her experience. Um, but what do you think the biggest policy difference, external effect of having more women MPs has been? Um, so the big change was 1997. Um, and, uh, I mean, again, academics like you will probably have analysed the, the numbers and so on, but my understanding is that 
issues of domestic violence and of childcare type issues are raised much, much more as a result of having more women uh, in the chamber. But I don't think it's just about also these issues then get raised. I think it's also about how issues get raised, what types of issues get raised within, uh, within debates and those different perspectives. And also even a bit of the ways of doing politics. I mean, we're talking about generalizations here. Um, but uh, but I, think, I think, you know, there are some uh, different styles that different people bring that sometimes you'll get, you know, men that won't have that sort of alpha male style. Um, and I think to have a better range of approaches to politics um, amongst men and women is, is healthy because just having it all like PMQs is not the most enlightening thing. Yeah, although women are quite good at shouting at PMQs as well, I've noticed. Yeah, I'm not. As I say, it's not entirely, um, it's not entirely a gendered thing. But I think, I think, uh, I think there is. Well, my experience sitting in there is that uh, that there is there's more kind of noise from the blokes. I, I mean, there's some weird noises in PMQs. Mm. I, I often remember thinking that some of them, and they would be like replicated. You know, the people have clearly like sort of, you know, got their PMQ noise that would be some kind of zoo animal type noise, and they, you know, they would do the same thing again and again. Um, but um, yeah, it's I mean, it, it's a bit of theatre, but it it's not Parliament at its best at all. Um, the, uh, the, you used the word I think naive. You used it earlier actually, and and you use it twice in the first chapter about yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, once in terms of thinking that you could achieve this change in, in uh, female representation without all women shortlists. But you then also use it, I, I thought it was a really interesting section where you discussed how in opposition you thought ministers were sort of all deciding. There's a friend, friend I hadn't realized um, all the constraints that ministers were working under. I naively assumed individual ministers could just snap their fingers and make a decision to accept an amendment to a bill they were taking through parliament. Um, and I just wonder whether, when you went into a government, you had more sympathy for people that had done the job before because you realised the, the constraints they work under and the cross pressures they work under. Well, I, and I know, I, I find, I sometimes long for the days of opposition where I could just say the simple sound bite and, and mean it because I used to say it and mean it and so that was fine. <laughs> and now I just know the world's a bit more complicated. I can't unknow that. Um, and so it, it does, you know, and I'm, I'm sort of determined not to just go for the easy soundbite, but to try to add some value and, and make a, an intelligent criticism about something that could actually be changed. But I do think I had no idea about how government worked. I mean, even things like clearance, how a position got agreed across government and how long that took. So you'd be thinking when you had a private member's bill or you were supporting someone else's private member's bill that, you know, it was really important to get lots of people writing in on the Wednesday and Thursday before it was being heard on a Friday. And I'm thinking now, well, it's been decided like a week before whether the government's going to support it or not. And so even if there's a big campaign at that point, it's just kind of too late. Um, so, so I think, I, and I don't think that's unusual actually because I think a lot of the organizations out there that lobby you know don't necessarily understand how those decisions are made um, and uh, yeah you, you you end up thinking the ministers got it all at their disposal but you know they're often being sent out there and occasionally being sent out to defend a line that they might not entirely think is the best way forward, but has been agreed through collective um, agreement and then will be put there. And I, I, I mean, I sometimes felt I, it was my responsibility to give credit where it was due um, from the dispatch box to, you know, if, if something was really, I mean, we, we ought to make sure the Conservatives get the credit for this particular announcement that I'm, I'm here to, uh, to defend today. Um, but, but yeah, it was sometimes challenging. Um, how much further do you think... Um the sort of Me Too movement has to go at Westminster? Well, I think it's not just at Westminster. Uh, I think there's a huge way to go more generally. And I, I still think there's parts of society that just don't get this. Um, and, I, I mean, I loved the President's Club um, expose that was done by the FT. I, I thought it was amazing that it was done by the FT, which is exactly where it needs to be. That's the people reading it that need to, you know, see this stuff. Um, but the letters page of the FT in the following days, oh, what a shocker. I mean, fair play to them for publishing the letters. But, you know, we had letters talking about the silly young girls. 
uh, at the President's Club. Um, and I love the tweet that talked about how, so let's get this straight. Um, all the women that were there knew exactly what they were getting into. But all the men that were there had no idea what it was about, and they left before it started. <laughs> and it, I mean, the double standards that we just saw applied in that whole thing were, were shocking. Um, but, th but that is it. I mean, there's people going there, well, what's the fuss about? I mean, well, they were being paid money, so they were, well, well they were being groped about. What's the problem? And that is the problem. It's that attitude. And uh, so, do, so do you think the authorities at Westminster are on top of this? Yeah, well, I was involved in the cross-party working group. We've published a very serious report with some really good recommendations. They still will need to be passed by Parliament in a vote um, within the next few weeks, and then further details um, hammered out. Um, but that is moving at a good pace while taking care to, to get it right. Um, and, and that's helpful, but that is, I mean, we've been looking at how do you put in place a complaints procedure that's independent, and then you can deal with it when there's problems. But the, the biggest thing we need to do is change the culture so this stuff doesn't happen in the first place. And one of the things that I fought very hard for in that working group, which we got, is an agreement that there should be compulsory training. And, you know, of, of MPs and staff, and any, particularly anyone who's employing members of staff. And I, I did an interview with... Um, John Humphreys on the Today programme about this, and he was kind of going, well, what, the MPs need training? That you know, Are you really saying they don't know what sexual harassment is? And, and the point is there's loads of people out there that don't know what it is because they've been doing this. They either don't know or they don't care. And that will include some MPs. There's 650. So, yeah, we need to make sure everyone's trained. But the fact that that's a sort of apparent, sensible line of questioning for a mainstream interviewer also tells you, speaks volumes about, you know, what people think of, of this issue. And, that, you know, the, the government's now rolling back on compulsory education on sex and relationships. I, I, I'm just dismayed. I'm like, you know, what more evidence do you need that teaching young people about consent, teaching all young people about consent is absolutely essential than this mess and all of these scandals that we still keep coming across? And, you know, we've seen Weinstein, we've seen um, Parliament, the charity sector... You know, you can say, the oh, that's Democrats. a problem. Yeah, every political party, right? Society, right? I mean, you know, do we think there's no sexual harassment going on at this university? Of course not. The, the, the statistics about sexual harassment in universities are terrifying. And even in schools, this happens to women and some men, but almost every woman will have experiences of harassment at various points in their lives. The age at which young people first experience it for girls, it's often in their early teenage years, if not earlier. You know, this is just not on. And the Me Too movement is brilliant for standing up, people having solidarity to say that. And it has got a long way to go because there's a big problem to change. And so, yeah, I think it will keep growing. And I think people will draw power from one another and keep taking action until it's taken seriously. Um, I'm going to... If you're going to do it, do it properly. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to wrap up soon, but and I have two questions I always ask. But before I do ask those, those questions, given Theresa May has made a speech today on university fees, um, as the party that took a lot of flack for introducing the current scheme, um, how do you look at her announcement? Um, well, I think it's helpful that some of the worst elements of the system, particularly the ones that the Conservatives have introduced um, since 2015, such as getting rid of maintenance grants. I think it's very helpful that that's now on the table and can be looked at. Because I think one of the difficulties about this debate is that there's so much focus on tuition fees. I understand that that's a big issue. But when I speak to young people at university, the issue of living costs is easily as much, if not more, of a barrier. Um, you know, some people are, are fortunate enough to have parents that will support them throughout university. For many people, that's not the case, either because they, you know, don't have that relationship with their parents or because their parents aren't able to. And in those cases, you know, how you actually make sure you pay your rent for your halls, residence, you are able to, you know, buy your textbooks, make sure you're, you know, well fed. And, you know, I mean, I worked part-time jobs, you know, throughout my university degree. Um, but even if people are doing that, I mean, you still need to have time to study. That's what the point of coming to university is about. So I think that living cost issue is one that 
deserves more airtime than it currently gets. But there's no magic answer to this. I mean, Labour like to say there's a magic answer to this. Um, but, it, you know, in reality, unless we have a massive increase in taxation, there's no magic answer um, to, uh, to the funding of higher education. I mean, in Scotland, um, you know, there's a good situation. You know, we got rid of tuition fees um, when we were in government in Scotland. Um, but what you've now had is you've had the grants rolled back by the SNP government. You've had massive cuts in further education. You know, huge numbers of college places lost. And Scottish universities are now constraining the students that they can take from Scotland because in order to make their finances add up, then they have to have a higher proportion of international students. So, you know, you can look at, you know, how amazing something is in, in another place and actually there's downsides there too. So, you know, we've got a review ongoing in the Lib Dems as well um, to to look again at this issue um, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, where that ends up. Um, we clearly got the politics appallingly badly wrong um, and, you know, I said we made some mistakes in government and this this would be pretty high on my list. Um, but would it be on your list politically or in policy terms? Because well, in policy terms, largely, it's yeah. done the things that you said it would so, do. So I think, I think the, the biggest problems were in the politics, given, you know, what had been in our manifesto before the election. Um, and so that was the biggest problem. I think in terms of once, you know, once you were in the realms of how you design a policy that tries to help more young people from lower income backgrounds go to university and protect funding for the university sector, we, you know, we actually delivered quite a good policy. We made it much more progressive than the existing policy. We raised the threshold at which you started paying back from 15,000 to 21,000. So that meant for young people in their, you know, first or second job earning, um, they were able to keep more of, of what they were earning each month. Um, and we were able to make sure we put a lot of extra resources into helping improve access, which I think is, you know, a massive issue. Um, and, and, you know, successfully, did so. So, I mean, a lot of that policy detail, you know, within that realm of if you're going to do this, how do you do it? I think we got that right. But, I mean, there's no doubt the, the politics of it were disastrous. Okay, two, two quick questions, and then we'll go to the audience. And these are the ones I ask everybody. Um, when you were growing up, who was your political hero? Uh, well, I'm going to say somebody who's not actually a politician, but I think she was a political hero. Uh, Anita Roddick. Um, she co-founded the, or she founded the Body Shop, and as well as being a very successful businesswoman, she also showed that business could be a force for good. She campaigned on everything from fair trade to workers' rights to, uh, you know, ending cosmetic testing on animals and safeguarding the environment. And I think she was a, a total inspiration, um, showing how you could do politics in ways without even being a formal politician. That's such a 1980s answer. Oh, well, I, I was uh, born in 1980, so, you know... <clears throat> In my defence. Um, uh, and if you had any advice for a young, aspiring politician, what would it be? Um, well, I, I mean, the first thing I'd say is do it, right? Politics is where you can get involved and change the world. And, uh, it, you know, if, you, if there's things that you think are wrong about the world that you want to change, um, and I would entirely understand if you do think that at the moment, uh, then it is, a, it is a great way to, to get involved and to do it. And so I would say find, find the party that chimes with your values and beliefs. Um, I'd love it if that's the Lib Dems. Um, and, you know, if so, by all means, get in touch. Um, uh, but, you know, if that's another party, I'd encourage people to get involved, you know, wherever their political home is, and, and then get stuck in. Um, and the one thing I would say that you probably need to develop is a support network and resilience because you know you you need to learn to lose as well as to win in politics okay um we're going to take questions from the audience um just a, a word on question questions um should be a question it should be a sentence that ends with a question mark it <laughs> It shouldn't contain the words, I have three points. Uh, and it shouldn't contain the words, secondly, thirdly, or if you're a Liberal Democrat, ninthly. <laughs> so we'll, we've got some microphones. I'll take the chat with specs here. Uh, and the woman uh, there. The, yes, yes, please, yeah. And we'll take two questions, and then we'll do two answers together. So please. Um, without going into post-mortem of Tim Farron's interviewing prowess. Um, to what extent is the Liberal Democrats really liberal and tolerant if a man cannot hold a job and his job becomes untenable because he has a certain worldview? Okay, and there. Uh, yeah. 
Um, I recently read Nick Clegg's book, How to Stop Brexit, which ended with a checklist of things to do, things like march, write to MP. But the final thing he recommended was that we should all join the Labour Party because that's where it will get stopped. Do you agree? <laughs> mm. Well, you're a difficult one. Um, so, uh, uh, so, uh, so, yeah, I think we are a liberal and tolerant party. I share an office with Tim Farron uh, in Parliament. Uh, we, you know, he is a valued member of the Liberal Democrats. He's, you know, still actively campaigning as an MP. He came to the conclusion personally that he couldn't combine being the leader of the party um, with, you know, his views and the scrutiny on some elements of those that that entails. And, you know, I, when I spoke to him about it, I actually encouraged him to, I was encouraging him to stay on shortly after the election. Um, and, uh, you know, he told me that you know, he'd come to this conclusion actually during the election campaign. And, you know, I could see sort of etched on his face the, the sort of the turmoil he was facing. And, I, you know, you can't, you can't force somebody to continue doing a job that's making them miserable. Um, and, you know, we can't, we can't prevent the media asking questions like that. You know, so, so if that's going to make him miserable, then, of course, you know, he's got every right to say, I don't want to continue doing this job. But he's still, uh, you know, a very active member of the party. Um, and we have got, you know, lots of people from all sorts of different faiths, you know, in the Lib Dems, and, and rightly so. And, you know, we have lively debates all the time. What, what do you think would have happened if, instead of equivocating, which he clearly was doing because he was torn, he'd simply said, uh, yes, I believe it's a sin, but I'm a liberal, and therefore I believe that we shouldn't punish people for their sin, we should legislate for <coughs> people to be free. I mean, I think in one of his formulations, he kind of tried well, to say tried, that. He tried, yes, yeah. Never, um, never quite as openly as that. Yeah, uh, but, I, I mean, uh, you know, th there's... Uh, you know, how, how long that would have lasted in terms of the media. I mean, that's the thing. I don't know what the perfect answer to the question is um, because I, I find it slightly difficult to come from the situation where you know, well, that's not something I feel comfortable saying. So, um, so uh, yeah, I suppose you either say it's not for me to, you know, share those private issues and sin, which he also tried, you know. And, I mean, you know, sometimes with media scrutiny, um, there's not necessarily fairness when you're a public figure as leader of a political party than even things which, to most people, we rightly defend the right for those to be purely private issues. They sometimes become issues of interest and, it, and it's a bit difficult to therefore keep things entirely private. And, you know, you have similar issues when you've had, you know, uh, I mean, obviously in slightly different issues where you've had politicians who've been saying one thing about, you know, the education system and then making a decision about where to send their child to school. Now, in normal circumstances, I would say it's really not fair game for the media to be intruding in where some, you know, the decisions somebody's making about their child and bringing that into it. But in those, you know, particular circumstances, then it would be brought into it. So, you know, as I say, we don't control the media, rightly. <laughs> um, we don't control the media. Um, and so it's, um, it, it's not like there was an easy answer to that. And, you know, Tim came to the conclusion that he did about what, for him, was the ultimate thing that he had to do. In terms of the question, should everyone join Labour? No. Um, and I, and I, I mean, I, um, I'm not sure that's exactly uh, what he said. I think what he was saying was, if you're sort of Labour-minded, um, then join Labour. And actually, I think he also suggested if you're kind of conservative, you know, if you're naturally a conservative, but you just don't happen to be a member of the party and you're anti-Brexit, then, you know, join the party and make your voice heard. Um, so that yes, that's that's not the um, that's that's not the only answer. But I, I would say I do like a book that gives a lot of checklist uh, of things that you can do. And he might have had one at the end of the book. I've got one at the end of every chapter. I wouldn't know that because I've only read the first chapter. <laughs> uh, um, we'll take the woman down here, please. Right, right, yeah, the sort of third row back. Uh, and yeah, go on. Yeah. And then guy uh, in the black shirt. So. Uh, about six rows down with his hand in the air, black hair, yeah. Yes, please. Um, is there a risk that the Good Friday Agreement will be sacrificed on the altar of Brexit by the Conservatives? And if we can get the mic across to Guy. Hello. This better be great, because the, the anticipation is now building. Hi, a guy from the Queen Mary Liberal Democrats. I just wanted to ask, um, you've 
as Phil has pointed out in the book you talk about, uh, beyond cultural changes in the party, sometimes we need significant structural changes. Uh, the Lord Order Dice report came out about two weeks ago and recommended that beyond a structural change, we need a cultural change in the party. I just wonder what you think that would look like in sort of manifested form at local level and what you make of the report as a whole and how we can reach out to BME communities because it's like clearly one of the most important things that we can do in our future. Sure. So that was, was a Liberal Democrat and there were at least three questions in there. <laughs> If it had been Simon Hughes, it would have been 16. Um, so, uh, so first of all, on the Good Friday Agreement, I mean, yeah, I think that's a huge risk. I, and and, and I, I think it's one of the many, many dismaying things about Brexit, you know, number 428 or something. Um, but, but it is, yeah, it is absolutely terrifying that, you know, you have a great success story there. And, you know, it's not all perfect, as we, as we know. But, you know, you basically have had, you know, a peace process that has you know, has been, you know, successful for 20 years and that is now at risk and, it, and it's sort of cavalierly at risk. I know that's not a word, but you know what I mean. Um, it, it just with this sort of attitude that almost like, well, we haven't really thought about it. I'm sure there'll be an answer somehow, but it doesn't really matter because it's Northern Ireland. It is almost what it feels like. You know, with this fudge that was created just before um, Christmas of, of saying that we'll have this um, regulatory alignment. Is that what was agreed in the end or was it no divergence? Anyway, the, 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 the dancing, so dancing on ahead of a pin with the language um, of saying that you basically have that that agreement, but then everyone else, uh, you know, in Scotland and, you know, Wales and everyone's like, well, we, we'd, love, we'd like that too, thank you very much. Um, but the, the real truth is you can't, you can't have that if you're not going to be in the customs union, at least. And that's what is also apparently a red line. So it, it does just feel like, you know, this is not being taken seriously enough um, by the government. And um, one of many, many, many reasons uh, why people should buy Nick Clegg's book on how to stop Brexit and uh, take action to, to, to stop it. Because we've got an opportunity, right? You know, the, you know, we have not left the European Union yet, right? It's not yet the end of March 2019. And, uh, you know, there is all to play for. Uh, and if you believe that Brexit is the wrong course for this country, then this is the pivotal year to get out there, to campaign, to, to win the argument. Um, because, you know, let me be really clear, you know, if public opinion shifts much more decisively than it has already, then the political um, pressure to um, provide the opportunity for people to have a say and then to have that opportunity to then reject Brexit, um, I think that gains a momentum that, that is potentially unstoppable. So, you know, do not despair. We have, you know, this is not inevitable. Our European partners have said very clearly to us, you know, sort of, if you change your mind, we can just sort of rip up that Article 50 letter. We'll pretend it never happened. And um, we, we, really ought to, we really ought to be using this time this year um, to, to make that happen. Do you really think we would be readmitted without having to abide by Schengen, for example? I, I think, I, I mean, I've certainly, in the past few, with, with the, the past the, few months, I've spoken to the Deputy Prime Minister of Ireland, French and German Ambassador, Bulgarian Ambassador. You know, there is, there is the words I think that the Irish Deputy PM said was, you know, there would be extreme generosity if we decided to... Um, that we, w that we wanted to stay. Because, you know, it, it's worse for us, but Brexit is also pain for the other countries in the, in the EU. Um, they don't want it to happen. And so, yeah, I, I think if we haven't yet left, then the, the ability for them to say by agreement that Article 50 basically ceases and we continue as we were is, is absolutely on the table. And you wouldn't be worried... I mean, you, you, your get-out here, presumably, is the... The referendum on the deal, because there must be a real risk of a significant chunk of the country, a third, maybe more, feeling utterly betrayed by the political class if this happened. I, I mean, I, look, I am, I'm not, uh, I'm not blind to the difficulties about this, um, but I do happen to believe that what we're on the brink of doing is so, is so. Uh, amazingly um, bad for our economic prospects, for our future influence in the world, for you know the whole opportunities that the next generation is going to have. That we need to take 
the chance and to try to make sure that we can have choose a different path. And I absolutely agree that you know this process started with a, a you know a full vote of the British people, and so if there is to be a change in direction, that can't just be something which is decided in Parliament or whatever. That needs to be something which is um, endorsed by the people um, fairly in a referendum. And, and I think that's you know what we've been proposing and setting out for many months now. Um, and which, as I say, more people are coming around to the view that that's something which would be a good way forward. But if it's a referendum on the deal, uh, and we don't really mean the deal, we mean the transition arrangements, because we don't even know what the deal is. When does that referendum take place? When is the campaign? We, we've said it should take place at the end of this year. But we won't know that we won't even know the terms of the transition arrangement by the end of this well, year. There will, there will be so we'll be, having, we'll be having a referendum on an unknown transition arrangement well, that might lead to an unknown I, I, deal. I, I could refer you to the comments from David Davis and uh, Liam Fox about how you know these deals would all be done and dusted within about six months. Yeah, but, they, but the just because they were ever. wrong, just because they were wrong, doesn't give you a get out. Um, we, we will. Look, we already have more of an idea of the shape. We already know, for example, that the government is pursuing a Brexit that means not being in the customs union, not being in the single market. I mean, that in itself is more information than we have back in June 2016 when plenty of Brexiteers merrily trotted out and said we can be like Norway and we'll, you know, we'll have this. And no one's suggesting leaving the single market, Dan Hannan would say, you know, confidently down the camera lens. So, you know, we already have more information and, and the shape of the deal will be nearer, uh, will be clearer to us. Um, so I, people will be in, in possession of, you know, many more facts than, uh, than, than were possible to have in June 2016. Okay, but they, they still won't know the... Act. We'll still be voting on something we don't know. Well, I mean, the alternative is that you don't have a vote at all, um, and then you have a deal imposed on you, and you don't have a chance to do anything about it. So, I mean, I can, I can get your argument that there's a kind of imperfections on this, but I think the imperfections of that are much better than, you know, you don't even know what it's going to be and then you just get whatever you're given. Okay, and uh, Guy's question yeah, about... Yeah, so, I mean, I think, I think this is a really important piece of work. And, and, and it's quite tough reading for the party, but rightly so, because I think this is an issue and this is a, a review about race in the party and, and race equality. Um, and, you know, we are far too white as a party, um, you know, and that's, you know, from our membership all the way through to the different parts of our, you know, elected bodies and decision-making structures. And so we do need to get really serious about tackling that culturally and and that involves I mean everything from you know training programs to, uh, to to some quite difficult conversations actually with some people you know who need to be called out and stuff and you know and I think I think society is you know delightfully is changing on all of these issues and where you have institutions that haven't kept pace and many organizations in society would be in a similar situation um, then you know it's right that we have a proper root and branch look at what we need to do and so you know I know the different structures of the party are looking at the review and then basically coming forward with right what's the action plan and I think the action plan is the absolutely concrete thing and I know the Federal board, this is getting a bit wonky and sort of libido, but the federal board is basically um, going to have this as a, you know, very closely monitored um, uh, plan of, you know, what happens at all levels of the party to implement this review. Okay, uh, take the woman, in, uh, woman on the front row here and then we'll take the chat with specs on the end there. Yes, please. Hi. Do you think it is perhaps um, telling that the Lib Dems as a party must probably don't have a huge, um, a well-formulated offer to women, that when Philip asked you earlier about any policies that have been reenacted because there's a surge of women in Parliament, things that perhaps, I'm surmising, Emily Thornberry wouldn't struggle to mention, such as the minimum wage, the protections for working mothers, and the paid maternity leave, the three things that are the most fundamental in lifting um, children from poverty, etc., is something that you necessarily did not mention. Is that because they're, like those things have already been covered and therefore there's a, a need for a new offer and none of the three parties have got something? Or is that because the Lib Dems perhaps are busy with maybe other things, you know, such as Brexit? Well, I mean, I, I think with some of those things, I think it's arguable like whether that was the influence of women. I think well, the minimum wage, for example, you know, it happened to coincide with that influx of women, but I think that was... That was already in Labour's sort of policy cupboard quite some time before that. Um, and to be honest, 
paid maternity leave, I suspect, might have predated that big influx of women, but maybe I'm not exactly right on the dates of that. Um, I would have imagined that would probably have been pre-97. But I mean, I think um, the, I mean, I wasn't answering it from a sort of party perspective. I mean, you know, when I was a minister, um, the thing I was proudest of doing was introducing shared parental leave because I very strongly believe that in order to get equality in the workplace, uh, we need to have much more equality at home. And I'm not going to say shared parental leave is perfect, not least because we have to deliver it in a coalition, but it's a really important step to where we need to get to. And recognising that gender equality is actually not just about women. So most of the negative impacts of gender inequality do fall on women, but some of them also fall on men. And the way in which fathers are treated in this society, the way they are assumed to be incompetent, uh, and the, are, they are, yeah, they are, they totally are. Mm -hmm. And they are, you know, undervalued. I mean, it, you know, you, I mean, it is almost sort of laughable sometimes. I'll share stories with my husband about, mm -hmm. you know, what people have felt able to come up to him and say on the bus when he happens to be on the bus with our mm -hmm. son who's got a big gash on his head, you know. And, he, you know, he hit his head at nursery, right? <laughs> so it wasn't like it was my husband's fault. But, you know, suddenly the unsolicited advice, because people assume that, you know, he's just... Um, been been incapable of of being a dad, um, and so we do need to um, to, to recognise those elements of, of gender inequality, and also, in order to change the workplace, if you have a wider range of men and women together who are wanting, you know, more flexibility, more modern ways of working, then I think you'll get that change more quickly. And the other thing which I managed to do in government, which I think will also be the beginning of a much bigger conversation and already is, was winning the fight to get the gender pay reporting in, which we fought the Conservatives for five years on. And then finally, at the last minute, there was like a, a, an opportunity I, I spotted because the Tories didn't want to lose the small business bill, which I also didn't want to lose. It was also partly my bill, but I, um, I thought they'd blink first. And uh, they did. So, um, so, so we basically got them to, to, to agree to gender pay gap reporting, which is now just um, coming into force. And, you know, we started to see what pay transparency can do because what it really does is it makes people ask other questions. And, you know, it will then go from there. So there's still a lot more that needs to be done. Um, and I and I recognise that. And also around, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, the list is, you know, is, I've written 90,000 words on it. Um, you know, there is so much that still needs to be done. And culturally as well, though, and I think government's got an important role to... to to play in that. And one of the, some of the stuff you know, I felt quite proud of was being able to use the government on things like the body image campaign that I ran and, and without legislating, but nonetheless give prominence to issues and campaigners that were really making a difference to people's lives. But for example, I tried to get a review of media sexism, which was totally blocked by the Conservatives. And I still think you know, the way in which women are portrayed day in, day out in the media is still one of the things that is the wallpaper that you know, reinforces the assumptions and the stereotypes and, and holds women back. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a huge amount still to be done um, by the government. But there is too much for government to do on its own. We also need a sort of movement of individuals taking action in their everyday lives. I think there's a special stare that mums have for dads at the school gate. It's a sort of, here he is, the useless dad, come to pick up his child. I mean, it's partly because I am pretty useless, but I, uh, as a father. But, but, uh, but, but I believe do, me, you I, can be I quite do, useless as a mother too. But you can, exactly, exactly. They, 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 I see the contempt in their eyes as I approach the school game. Sorry, the uh, chap up there with the glasses. Yes, please. Hello. Um, do you think there are any liberal arguments for Brexit in terms of devolution, free trade or immigration? Or is it all bad news? And if so, why? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking hard now. Um, no, I, I don't... Well, I, I suppose the liberal argument for Brexit would be the, the pure sovereignty argument in terms of um, that sort of freedom issue over your own your own affairs that would be the argument and you know there is a there is a respectable argument to be made that says I believe it is just more important that we have all of that sovereignty even if we are poorer even if we have less influence even if we um, have less um, 
enrichment of our culture through greater trade and movement of people between countries. Um, I disagree with that, but that is what I would say would be the sort of respectable argument. And the difficulty is that's not the argument that gets made. It's a sort of have your cake and eat it argument, which Boris famously makes, which suggests that you know you can reduce immigration and you can not have any, you, you can have no um, jurisdiction uh, from anyone else over your own laws, but somehow you'll be allowed to create trade deals, but they won't be able to require you to have the same standards that will then be upheld in any way. Well, you're, you're for, for, there is an argument, isn't there, about trade, which is, for example, we can trade with a, another country, and when we trade with them, our manufacturers have to uphold those standards, but we don't have to impose those standards on the rest of the country. I mean, that's, that's the argument that's made. I mean, or, or I could think about arguments about... Uh, the ability to have immigration from anywhere in the world rather than... But it's not like we don't have that ability. We do have that ability. We've got a government that has created a ridiculous fa false cap on immigration numbers that is unachievable anyway without doing huge economic harm and doesn't seem to serve any other purpose than a purely political one. So, you know, it's not like being a member of the EU stops us having immigration from other parts of the world. No, but because it's imbalanced. I mean, for example, Diane Abbott's argument always was that, and the argument from people on the left of the Labour Party was that this was, a, it was effectively a racist organisation, wasn't it? Because you had immigration from Eastern Europe, which was uncontrolled uh, and which was white, and because you had large numbers coming in from Eastern Europe, you therefore were basically forced to put up caps against the rest of the world, which is non-white. And I could imagine a situation in which someone on the left might say, it would be better to have equal immigration from anywhere in the world, and, and not, except, not on a racist basis. Except nobody was really making that argument, because that's not actually the position of you know, anyone that's, that's supporting Brexit that I can see. No, no, but, but even, no, <laughs> that's true. But it's an argument that you could make, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I personally take the view that we, um, through the European Union, we are able to be part of the most successful peace project of all time. We're able to be part of a trading area where we have much more clout economically and also politically. Uh, our companies have an ability, therefore, to grow more easily because they're part of this huge market. And then from there, they're able to use that as a stepping stone. Um, you've got the reduced transaction costs. You've got the reduced regulatory burdens. And it doesn't stop you making trade deals with the rest of the world. I mean, Germany trades a lot more with China than we do. They're a member of the European Union. It's not as if this is this is problematic. So, uh, you know, the, I, I, I really remain to, to not, be convinced of They're not able to the, make their own trade deal with China, are they? But, but it's not that the trade deal is what's constraining us in terms of exporting and trading with, with China. I mean, that that's... That's not the issue. It's not the deals that have been done. And actually, being able to do deals as part of a bigger entity gives you, gives you much more clout in those negotiations than what we're going to have. And I mean, as you say, you know, you might, if you don't, if you don't happen to like the regulatory standards that are imposed, then you might take the view that you would like to not have them. But you know, I, I'm not sure I really want to be eating chlorinated chicken, thank you very much. You know, I quite like having good food welfare standards and safety standards on products when I go and, you know, buy toys for my son. You know, I think it's good that we've got rules about how much lead you're allowed to have in the paint and, you know, all of those things. They, they still, sort of get... We can still have all of those things, can't we? Well, we, well, we, we, we can decide, but the, yeah, the, but the Brexiteer would argue we can decide to have those things. Yes, we can, but it's not as if we've got a massive problem with the ones that exist at the moment, and you've actually found that on lots of different issues, we've ended up having better regulation through having that, you know, agreed across the European Union and the businesses then get the benefit of having one set of rules to comply with rather than 28 different sets. Of okay, rules. we'll take two final questions and then uh, we'll wrap up. So a uh, woman in the middle row there, yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, and then we'll take this chap, the red top down at the front, please. Um, hello. Uh, this sounds like quite a facetious question, but I mean it genuinely. Uh, why are you a Liberal Democrat? Okay. And uh, if we can take quickly take a mic down to the chat at the front, that'd be great. Uh, hi. I used to live, I, I do live, I suppose, uh, in what was your husband's old constituency in Chippenham. And that constituency swung to the Conservatives. And in 2017, the swing increased to the Conservatives. 
and that's something that was replicated across the country in many other constituencies. So my question is, how do you break the conservative hold over rural areas? Because it seems to be somewhere that's been forgotten by the two other major parties in this country. Sure. Um, well, if I take that question first, I, I mean, I, th I think probably most people in, in the constituency of Chippenham don't live in very rural areas. They're mainly in the towns. But, um, but nonetheless, you're right that, I mean, there you know, those were significant swings. And it was the phenomenon that I talked about earlier, where it was people that had voted Liberal Democrat. It wasn't that they deserted us and went to the Labour Party and the Conservatives got through the middle. It was that they, you know, they switched directly to um, to the Conservatives and said, well, what's more important for me is to have a Conservative government. And I think this goes partly to that issue of when people are so terrified in those areas of what's on offer from the Labour Party. And there might be some areas of the country where it's in the opposite direction. And, you know, there, there is no doubt... Um, that, that some of that is a difficult, um, you know, a difficult problem to overcome. Where you know people would say to my husband, "Well, we think you're a great MP, but it's more important to me here that we have a Conservative MP," um, and and that's kind of been the part of the challenge that we've had since since day one. And uh, you know, part of that's about the issues and the offer that we have. Part of that's about credibility, and so that's about making sure that we do, um, you know, fight in the council by elections and show that we're gaining momentum. It, that's why it was a success and why it was important that at the election last year that we increased our number of MPs. Um, so it, all of this is part of the, the Lib Dem fight back. Um, and, you know, there is a different dynamic on British politics now where, um, and, it, you know, it's not exclusively about a rural urban thing, but more urban areas where more remain voting. And this remain leave dynamic is, you know, a huge sort of filter through which the rest of politics is is seen. And as a very strongly pro-European pro party, um, then that can be an additional barrier, and it probably has an impact on um, on, on some of the areas where we're most likely to do well in, in future elections. And in answer to the question about why I'm a Liberal Democrat, I'm going to give you two answers. Maybe this is very Lib Dem of me, but I'm going to tell you why I became a Liberal Democrat and, and also why I am one now. So uh, it was very straightforward for me when I was a teenager and I joined the party. There were two main issues that drew me to the Lib Dems. Um, the first one was education, and that was at the time of uh, Paddy Ashdown's leadership, a penny on income tax for education, which I believed and still believe is the sort of cornerstone of um, the successful society we want to build because it, it has the positive impacts for so many other parts of uh, society from health to crime levels to the economy um, and so investment in education is absolutely crucial and that's why I was so proud of the pupil premium that we delivered uh, in government um, to really make sure that you know people from whatever background could get the best start in life um, and the other reason that I joined was proportional representation so I really am a true liberal democrat that was that was one of my <laughs> founding reasons um, perhaps slightly ironically growing up in a constituency in the west of Scotland uh, that I thought was dreadfully unfair because when I was old enough to vote I was like well it doesn't matter how I vote because it's always going to elect a Labour MP um, and all right there were boundary changes but I was then later elected there uh, and then the SNP so you know it obviously wasn't always going to elect a Labour MP uh, but now um, Lib Dem again which is which is nice um, but the, um, the 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 why I'm a Liberal Democrat I mean so those are the reasons I joined but um, my sort of liberal journey if you like uh, in understanding liberalism better, which I've done from a practical sense. I didn't study politics, you know. Um, so it wasn't like I, you know, went and read John Stuart Mill and decided that I was a Lib Dem as a result. Um, but it is about freedom. It is about um, a focus on the individual, that every individual matters, and that they are an individual. So it's not to say that we can't come together and have more power together. We absolutely can. But it is about valuing the person as an individual, and that's where my, you know, support for things like equality come from. Um, and also that sort of open open-minded open-hearted internationalist outlook um, which I think the Liberal Democrats have at our core um, that is part of my my worldview of the kind of um, world that we want to live in and that also is by the individual really it's about saying yes countries are important nation states are important as structures but you know we are I think there is such a thing as a citizen of the world you know we are all in this world together and there's a lot of problems that we have to face jointly um, you know ones like climate change are really obvious where you know one country's actions are impact on another country's actions but but wider challenges of uh, of poverty of um, you know extremism crime terrorism and so on um, so we have to work together and, um, and and that for me that that comes back to my sort of basic you know liberal outlook about freedom and the individual have there been moments where as part of that journey 
your faith in the party has been tested? Um, I, I mean, I, there's been moments of frustration in the party. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's been times that I've come out of committee meetings and, you know, head in your hands moments about uh, sort of decisions being made. And there's been times, you know, as I explained in the book, when I've been frustrated about, you know, decisions that have been made by, uh, by leadership and so on. But the party's bigger than that to me. I mean, it, it feels very much like a family. It's that kind of environment. Um, even though it's a much bigger family now that we've got, you know, 100,000 members, which is many more than when I first joined. Um, but, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's... I, I suppose, you know, the, the wee individuals that sometimes do your head in, but that's life, really, isn't it? Um, the basic values and principles that we're fighting for uh, are bigger than that. And, you know, I, I still absolutely see that, you know, we're a vehicle for change, and I hadn't ever imagined when I was elected at the age of 25. And I suppose I thought, well, I'm 25, maybe in my lifetime I might see the Lib Dems in government because, you know, I might live for another 60 years or something. Mm. Um, but I'd, I'd never really, it never crossed my mind that I would end up as a government minister able to put liberal policies into action. And for all the difficulties that came with coalition government, as I say, you know, challenging compromises and such like, you know, you come into politics to change things. And, you know, I introduced shared parental leave, gender pay gap reporting, uh, dramatic new rights in the Consumer Rights Act, you know, fairer um, treatment of suppliers and supermarkets with the Groceries Code Adjudicator, you know, improved insolvency regulation, um, improved corporate transparency in, in lots of different ways. You know, I, I feel so lucky that I've been in that position to be able to put into practice things that I believe, you know, liberal values uh, as a government minister. And I still think there's a lot in the world that needs to be fixed, which is why, having lost my seat in 2017, it took me about 15, half a... Half, 15. Sorry, 2015, thank you. Mm -hmm. It took me about half a second in 2017 when Theresa May called the election to be absolutely clear that, you know, I wanted to come back. There's a lot more to do. Thank you. Um, that was fascinating. We're going to prove that um, uh, universities spend their money very wisely by offering the audience a terrible glass of wine in a minute. Um, Fine by me. <laughs> uh, if you could show your appreciation to Joe and the usual <laughs>